Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello, learners of pathology. Today, we will be discussing on differentiation and altered differentiation. You will be going through and you will understand and know the terminologies to understand differentiation and in that we will be looking at what is regeneration and stem cell. Then we will look at altered differentiation and the two conditions of altered differentiation that is metaplasia and dysplasia. When we look at the body, when we look at various tissues, tissues have lot of cell population and the cells all come from stem cells and these cells go on proliferating and being increased in number. Some of these cells undergo differentiation to perform specialized functions. But along with proliferation, there is also always cell death by apoptosis. In the body, there is a homeostasis between the cells which are proliferating and the cells which are dying. So that is the normal process. Now, when we look at cell injury, when cells are injured, lot of cells are being lost. And when these cells are lost, there are mechanisms by the body whereby the cells regenerate or they are replaced. The cells which are lost need to be replaced. And that process is what we call as regeneration. What is regeneration? It is actually the proliferation of cells and tissues to replace injured or dead cells and tissues. Different cells have different regenerative capacity. Based on the regenerative capacity of cells, we can divide all cells into three types. They are called as labile cells, stable cells and permanent cells. Let us look at each one of them. Labile cells, they are the cells which go on dividing continuously throughout life. They are getting replaced every other day, every day and there is a rapid turnover and there are so many examples in our body where more many of the cells or most of the cells are labile cells. For example, the cells of the skin, the cells of the oral cavity, the cells that line not only the oral cavity right down into the gastrointestinal system and right down. Then there are other cells that, that line the uh, secretory ducts, the hematopoietic stems, the hematopoietic blood cells they are all examples of labile cells. If we look at a clinical application of labile cells, one that we can look at is skin grafting. Skin is removed or the skin is shaved off from one part of the body so that it can be used to replace the skin at a very, at a site where there is an ulcer that is not healing or maybe it is a burn wound in such areas that piece of skin that is shaved off is used. To the person or the person who is the site to which the skin is being replaced, what happens there? This shaven skin is placed there and there it grows at that site. Similarly, from the site where the skin has been removed, you can see that in the picture there are sprouting small blood that is coming out, but again at that site, the skin gets totally replaced very fast. So this is all because of the cells being, the skin cells being labile cells. So we can look at various examples. Another example where skin as a labile cell is being used is in derm abrasion. What happens there? All the ladies and even the gents, they now go to the beauty parlor for cosmetic purposes to beautify the skin. What is happening there actually? 
the skin surface cells of the skin are being removed and then uh, the old the cells below are being are coming up so that increases the beauty what is dermaburation basically when there are deep scars in the skin by specific techniques the surface skin is removed and the skin becomes the scars are hidden and the skin becomes beautiful that is dermaburation so there are various clinical applications you can just think of various things that are possible which physiologically happen and also otherwise that the labile cells or the skin cells not only the skin cells the gastrointestinal cells are being replaced on a daily basis and we are what we are because of the labile cells the next thing are the stable cells the stable cells are quiescent cells and what what do you mean by that they divide very infrequently under normal conditions or normally they do not divide but they go on to rapid division when there is cell injury or cell loss so examples of them would be the liver cells the kidney tubular cells muscle cells fibroblasts even the bone so bone when we look at a fracture we know that the bone heals by uh, and the the bone unites together that is because they are stable cells another typical example of a of stable cells and its clinical application is in liver transplant now what happens in liver transplant as the ct shows from the donor the area that is marked a, a lobe of the liver is removed from the donor and that is placed on to a recipient but at the site where the liver lobe has been removed you can see subsequently that there is compensated growth of the remaining hepatocytes so that they grow back and the liver gets back to the normal size though it will not be the actual resected lobe that is being replaced there is compensatory growth that is very well evident also in experimental animals like in the rat liver that you can see there again the liver lobe has been removed but you see that there is regeneration and the liver cells have got replaced to uh, the almost same size as it was before so that is what happens when the stable cells are lost they get back they revive back and they divide and regenerate the next group of cells are the permanent cells they are actually the non dividing cells normally they divide only during the fetal life and they cannot be replaced after birth examples of them are the neurons the cardiac muscle cells and maybe the retinal cells and so on but we have to take it now with the recent research that there is that is happening that even permanent cells are said to have partial tendency of regeneration so that is something that we know now yeah now to talk of stem cells stem cells are cells which have regenerative capacity or replicative capacity they are actually the parent cells from which all daughter cells form so when we talk of all these types of uh, cells labile stable cells the cells which are coming back or the daughter cells or the proliferation is because of the stem cells if you look at the embryo the first the stem cell single from a single cell that the baby is developed there is the zygote where the ovum and the sperm unite so that is actually the totipotent stem cell so that becomes the blastocyst and from that we have what are called as the pluripotent stem cells they are also called as the embryonic stem cells now these pluripotent stem cells can go on to differentiate further and they can become multipotent stem cells committed cells and from them we get cells which are derived from the ectoderm endoderm and mesoderm which go on to become the differentiated cells so that is how the stem cells function in the baby now if we go on to a little further than this these embryonic stem cells are very important in the sense that they are pu the pluripotent stem cells if they are cultured in vitro that is outside then these cells can be converted or they can be differentiated into different types of differentiated cells so that is something that is seen and that is very much in the news now and in uh, the medical science now where regenerative medicine has come up very well and 
and because of this these different stem cells can be this the embryonic stem cell can be made to other uh, differentiated stem cells and they can be used for repairing damaged tissue. Another area that is also there is what is called as trans differentiation. Because it is linked to differentiation I am bringing that up too. Now when we have cells which are differentiated that is like hematopoietic stem cells, stem cells. I am taking the hematopoietic stem cells because a lot of work has been done on hematopoietic stem cells and these hematopoietic stem cells are known to be reprogrammed so that they can be made to develop into other types of differentiated cells. That is a hematopoietic stem cell can become a cardiac uh, cell or it can become a neuron and so on so that they can be used to dam to uh, repair damaged organs. So, that is what you mean by trans differentiation. Now, going on further and to bring us all back to what differentiation is, the definition of differentiation. The cells which develop overt specialized function and morphology that distinguishes it from its parent cell is called as differentiation. So, this differentiated cell has got specialized function and specialized appearance and it is different or it so that it is different from the parent cell. So, the parent cells are always the stem cells and they are like maybe when we look at it morphologically a blue cell, but when we look at mature differentiated cells they can be of different types. Now, this is something that I have already explained, but just to get it across once again when we have pluripotent stem cells these stem cells can get differentiated to cells of various cell types and they can be derived from the ectoderm, endoderm and mesoderm and also these cells depending on the regenerative capacity they can be labile cells, stable cells or permanent cells. So, all these types of cells that we have in the body the hematopoietic cell, the cardiac cell, the neuron, the skeletal muscle, the fibroblast, the skin cells all of them are differentiated cells. So, when we come back to the altered differentiation, I would like to highlight that when we look at the cell cycle and the normal cell and how cell injury occurs, the, the way in which altered differentiation can happen is by two disorders that is metaplasia and dysplasia. So, it is a reversible form of cell injury and or an adaptation. So, let us look at that in more detail. So, what is metaplasia? I mean, a metaplasia is an acquired form of altered differentiation. Each of these words are important. It is an acquired form of altered differentiation characterized by reversible transformation of one mature differentiated cell type to another differentiated cell type. So, it is reversible and there is transformation of one mature cell type to another mature cell type and it usually occurs as an adaptive response to environmental stress. So, to look at the types of metaplasia, we have epithelial metaplasia and mesenchymal metaplasia. Epithelial metaplasia can be squamous metaplasia and glandular metaplasia and mesenchymal or connective tissue metaplasia can be an example is osseous metaplasia. The most common of these is squamous metaplasia. Looking at an example of this, the typical example is what we see in smokers. In smokers, the bronchi are lined by pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium, but with smoking, the, cause the toxins in the smoke cause a chronic irritation on the ciliated epithelium, so that after some time, these ciliated epithelial cells become stratified squamous epithelium. So, when we look at the diagram above, you will see that at the base of the cells of the pseudostratified columnar epithelium, there are certain reserve cells or parent cells or stem cells. So, because of the chronic irritation of the smoke and the toxins in the smoke, these cells are signaled, there is a change in the signal, there is a genetic change, so that subsequently the cells which are produced by these 
parent cells are squamous and not pseudo certified ciliated columnar epithelium. So, that is what happens and that is how squamous metaplasia occurs. So, in, sm in smokers the pseudo stratified ciliated columnar epithelium is becoming squamous epithelium. So, that is squamous metaplasia. To look at another example, this is again the same example of the bronchus, but if you look at it you can see that from below the squamous epithelium has totally replaced the pseudo stratified epithelium which is seen as a single layer on the top. Another example is the cervix. You can see the endocervical tissue lined by the columnar epithelium, but immediately after that you can see the junction where it becomes stratified squamous epithelium. So, this again is squamous, epi, uh, squamous metaplasia that has occurred in the cervix. Now, looking at glandular metaplasia, I have given you the images of the esophagus. The normal esophagus is lined by, by stratified squamous epithelium and that is why we see the keratin layer as a gl white glaze on the top. And with the chronic reflux that happens or the regurgitation of gastric contents from the stomach into the esophagus, the lower part of the esophagus gets metaplastic and the lower part of the esophagus gets lined by squamous, from squamous it becomes columnar epithelium. So, the lower part of the esophagus which is normally lined by squamous epithelium gets lined by columnar epithelium. So, that is seen as a reddish area in the uh, clinical specimen, but microscopically when you see it the normal squamous epithelium gets replaced by columnar epithelium which can be either of the intestinal type or of the gastric type. So, either of the epithelium can replace the squamous epithelium, this is glandular metaplasia. Then Looking at mesenchymal metaplasia, an example of mesenchymal metaplasia is osseous metaplasia and an example for that is myositis ossificans. So, here what is happening? It is a metaplastic bone. It can be seen in maybe athletes and people who are very active where in the proximity of the in the proximity the muscle in the proximity of the uh, bone they can show some fibroblast proliferation and later on that can get calcified and then ossified. So, that is seen as in the x-ray you can see it as a whitish um, area or a mass which is actually bone which has been replaced from the fibrous tissue or the fibroblasts. So, an example of osseous metaplasia. Now, to go on to the next that is dysplasia. Dysplasia the characteristic features of dysplasia are increased cell growth cellular atypia and decreased differentiation. It is basically an example of disordered growth or differentiation. So, to look at what dysplasia is, we looked at the three characteristics. The main reasons for the dysplasia is that it can occur with chronic injury, irritation or exposure to carcinogens. The very important thing is that in the early stages it is reversible and it in the later stages it is irreversible and it can also be pre-malignant. To look at the features of dysplasia again the three characteristic features increased growth. What do you mean by increased growth? It means increase in the thickness of the epithelium. It is similar to hyperplasia increased growth is hyperplasia and here also we see increase in the thickness of the epithelium. And similarly, there is also increased mitosis. That means, the number of mitosis are more so that that shows that the cells are proliferating and there is a lot of uh, increase in the number of cells. But there are a lot of differences from hyperplasia in dysplasia. Looking at the next feature of dysplasia, cellular atypia. What are the characteristics of cellular atypia? One is pleomorphism. What do you mean by pleomorphism? Pleo means varied, morphism means the appearance. So, if you look at the, the various cells that have been drawn here, pleomorphism means variation in the size and the shape of the cells, variation in the size and the shape of the cell 
and the nucleus that is very well depicted here in the various cells that are shown. Then the next feature of a tipia is increased N C ratio. Now, what do you mean by increased N C ratio? N is nucleus, C is the cytoplasm. So, when we look at cells, if you look at a normal cell, a normal cell has got a lot of cytoplasm and the nucleus is in the center. So, there is abundant cytoplasm. But if we look at dysplastic cells, what we see is that the nucleus is very big so that the nucleus almost fills the whole of the cell so that the cytoplasm becomes very scanty. So, that is when we say that the N C ratio is high. So, these dysplastic features are also features of neoplasms or tumors when they occur. Then the third feature of atypia is increased nuclear DNA or what we call as hyperchromatic nucleus. What do you mean by hyperchromasia? Hyper means increase, chrome is color. So, increase in the color of the nucleus or very darkly stained nucleus that is because of the the dysplastic changes or the neoplastic changes that happen, there is a lot of nuclear material that is there in the cell. So, as a result of which it has a very dark color and that is hyperchromatic. So, these are the typical features of atypia which we see in dysplasia and which we can also see in neoplasms. Going on to the next feature of differentiation or decreased differentiation as a feature of dysplasia. Decreased differentiation means the cells, you can see the normal squamous epithelium, you can see the various layers of the squamous epithelium. As they go higher or in the superficial areas, they are very much flattened and the keratin starts forming there. When we say loss of polarity, it means that there is a disorganization in the way the cell layers are arranged. So, they are not one above the other and there is no order. So, that is called a cellular immaturity and loss of polarity. Cellular immaturity means basically that the cells become more de-differentiated or decrease differentiated. So, if you are talking of squamous cells, if the cells do not look like squamous cells and they look like more like some blue cells, then we say that the differentiation has decreased. So, that is again a feature of dysplasia. So, with these three features, another picture that is shown here is of the glands which are showing dysplasia. You can see normal glands lined by columnar epithelium, very uniform glands, small nucleus and along with that you can see dark glands with proliferation, increase in the number of uh, layers, mitotic figures which are clear vacuoles with a cell in the center and also very dark that is hyperchromatic. Nuclei. So, these are all features of dysplasia. Here you are seeing it not in the squamous epithelium, but you are seeing it in a gland. So, if you are to look at the features of dysplasia, if you compare it with the normal squamous epithelium, if the changes are mild occurring only in the lower part of the, uh, the stratified squamous epithelium, it is mild dysplasia. As the symptoms are, or as the features increase, where the uh, hyperchromasia increases, the mitotic figures increase, the, the, uh, the immaturity increases, you can get moderate dysplasia and severe dysplasia when you have the whole thickness of the stratified squamous epithelium being replaced by the dysplastic epithelium. And when you talk of severe dysplasia, here one other term that is used is carcinoma in situ. But when we use the word carcinoma in situ, we ensure that the basement membrane, all these changes have happened within the basement membrane and they have not pierced the basement membrane. So, that is severe dysplasia or carcinoma in situ. So, with these different phases, the, it is dysplasia is reversible in the early phases and it is pre-malignant. So, because if it goes on to severe dysplasia, it becomes carcinoma and then it can go on to become invasive carcinoma. A typical example of this is what we see clinically and linking up the altered differentiations, we can see the link as to how they progress one after another. 
metaplasia can progress to dysplasia, dysplasia of varying grades, high form of dysplasia can become a neoplasia. A typical example of, C of this is seen in the fate of a smoker. If you look at the lining of the bronchi in the smoker, it is normally it is pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium. But with the smoking that he does, which he uh, starts with, after some time it goes on to squamous metaplasia, that is the pseudostratified epithelium becomes squamous epithelium. That is seen in the two second and the third frame. Then if he continues the smoking, then it goes on to dysplasia. We looked at the three features, increase in the growth, in, uh, differentiation, atypical changes and loss of polarity. Those changes we will see when we talk of dysplasia. And if he continues the smoking, then it will go on to the severity, the severity increases and it can become carcinoma in situ where all the layers of the uh, squamous epithelium are dysplastic with the base membrane intact and subsequently he can get a carcinoma, squamous cell carcinoma of the lung where you have the base membrane that is breached and the neoplastic cells in the lung tissue also. So, this is what happens to a smoker if he is to continue smoking. If he stops smoking of course, then the early dysplasia it can go back to the normal state. So, coming back with all this to neoplasia which is different or which is a continuation of dysplasia, you, neoplasia is an abnormal, uncoordinated and excessive growth which persists even after the initial stimulus is removed. When we talk of hyperplasia, the cells proliferate, they grow, they increase in size, but when the stimulus is taken off, when the stress is taken off, they stop growing. Here the new, in neoplasia, they are abnormal, it is uncontrolled and excessive growth and along with it genetic alterations happen and it is an irreversible process. In neoplasia, you would be do dealing in detail about neoplasia, I am not dwelling on that more. And a word about differentiation in neoplasia. We talk of benign tumors in neoplasia. T tumors are said to be well differentiated, that is they resemble the tissue of origin. While malignant tumors can vary from being well differentiated to moderately differentiated to poorly differentiated or anaplastic. That means they do not, they go on decreasing from the way they look at, uh, they look like their parent. So they become like some blue cells. So from a stratified squamous epithelium which we can recognize, it becomes just some blue cells. So that is when we say that it is anaplastic. So that is a feature of malignant tumors. So to summarize, we looked at various aspects of differentiation. We looked at metaplasia and dysplasia as disorders of altered differentiation and we looked at each one of these in detail, the features, the examples, the causes, the clinical applications of each of these and then lastly how dysplasia can also become an irreversible neoplasia. Thank you.